Once again, can I have your attention? We're going to begin at 2.10 this next lecture. And let me take the opportunity to remind us all that tonight, good news, we're going to lose an hour of sleep. You're going to uh, move your clock up an hour tonight for daylight savings time for tomorrow, spring ahead. We're so glad to have you all today, and we are just absorbing all of this. And this hour, this is one of my favorite ones, it's called, Is Creation Scientific? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this wonderful lectures, Father. Thank you for Jeff's willingness to come and the material he has and his heart and mind in studying, Father, to present to us these things, Father. Uh, help us to absorb them, Father. Help us to use them in our everyday lives. So I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jeff? Okay. <clears throat> Last lecture today before we get to do a Q&A, and I'll uh, maybe be a little more relaxed and informal. <clears throat> Appreciate you being here this weekend. A good good number of people, and I feel like you're staying with me well. I know it's 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 a lot of information. It's like a fire hose, right? Of information coming out of your face, but I uh, usually have to hear it a few times, probably before you can really assimilate everything. There's just so much. I get that. I understand that. Uh, but hopefully you're being able to gather uh, some things that will be uh, helpful to you in learning a little more about God. Hopefully, especially the young people are learning some things that are going to help them to be able to uh, bolster their faith, faith and defend the truth to their friends. All right, so evolution and the Big Bang are the major components of the story that naturalists believe explains our existence. And so evolution and the Big Bang are the primary parts of the naturalistic model, the scientific explanation of what has happened throughout the history of the universe with only natural explanations, no God involved. Our model, our story of what happened historically and scientifically, the creation model, of course, is a little bit different, right? Uh, so in the previous sessions, we've now laid this model out. So the biblical creation story, the framework that helps us to understand the history of the universe and make sense of the evidence around us. So we looked at the evidence for God, specifically the God of the Bible and the inspiration of the Bible, and then the guts of what the Bible teaches us about history and how science reveals that and even expands that knowledge. So can that model, can that framework for viewing the universe uh, can it explain the evidence from science and history uh, and actually even be able to uh, withstand scrutiny, make predictions that then we can go carry out research and, and uh, fill out our model more? Can the creation model be defended as we're told to do, 1 Peter 3.15? So we want to look at that in this session and the one tomorrow morning in the Bible class hour. And so these sessions will illuminate why the previous ones are so important to have, have clear in your mind because they will give you the underlying framework for how to respond to the critics. And so as we look at the attacks that are being made against creation, you're going to hear me state several times, uh, point back to things in the model that we have looked at uh, that give an answer to these charges. <clears throat> so I want to... Uh, spend some time responding to some of Bill Nye's attacks against creation and use that as kind of our, uh, our way to, to show the kinds of challenges that are being thrown out there against the biblical creation model. So it was actually 10 years ago, February, that, um, um, that this debate occurred. I can't believe it was that far back. So Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, squared off against Ken Ham, who's a CEO at, uh, at Answers in Genesis. And uh, <clears throat> whenever they opened it up to just open questions back and forth, I would say that Bill Nye brought up some great challenges that Ken Ham really wasn't, he didn't deal with. And it made it appear as though the creation model is not able to withstand scrutiny, that it's not a scientific model. And uh, so one of the big points he kept bringing up that Ken Ham did not respond to, which was very frustrating, 
So far, Mr. Ham and his worldview, the creation model, does not have this capability. It cannot make predictions and show results. The big thing I want from you, Mr. Ham, is can you come up with something that you can predict? Do you have a creation model that predicts something that will happen in nature? So this is a common argument that is brought up against creation. The idea, this isn't talking about predictive prophecy. Like creationists need to be able to make prophecies into the future. So that's not what I was talking about. This is saying that if you develop a theory in science... You need to be able to make predictions about it. So let's say I let's say I, I think that there is an invisible force that uh, sucks smaller mass items towards larger mass items, like a big magnet. Then I should be if if my theory is true, then I should be able to make a prediction with that. I should say, okay, if I'm right, then when I go out and carry out an experiment where I take something like this remote and drop it, since it's a lower mass it should get sucked towards the ground since it's a much larger mass. And so I go and carry out an experiment, and if that actually happens, it provides some validity to my theory. It doesn't necessarily prove it, but if it doesn't happen, if I drop this and it doesn't suck down there, I've now falsified my theory. Okay, so this is how science works. I mean, we're working to try to falsify theories, and if you keep not being able to falsify it, if the evidence keeps supporting your theory then you're now giving it more and more confidence and credibility that it might be true, even though we never really know for sure whether it is. So he's saying creationists can't do basic science. We can't make predictions. Now, I've intentionally already used the term prediction multiple times in this seminar to show you creationists have always made predictions that end up being verified when you go look at the evidence. Now, Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, just must not have ever looked at our literature to see so I didn't know what he's talking about. So after that debate and my frustration, I went ahead and just made a list of 30 predictions that creationists have been able to make based on Scripture that have been verified whenever we've, we've gone out and actually looked at the evidence. And, uh, and I'm not going to go through every one of these. I do deal with this in my uh, Bill Nye Kenham debate review, which is available for free on our website and a reason a revelation I wrote 10 years ago. Uh, so I want to go ahead and just look at a few of these in this session. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, I actually have uh, a, di a dinosaur day. See, my Science versus Evolution seminar deals like with the first 10 of these. I have a dinosaur day event uh, that's more for teenagers that deals with a lot of these dinosaur uh, predictions. But... Um, I do want to start with number 12 here. So if, if the earth is relatively young and humans lived alongside the dinosaurs, we would predict that there'd be evidence the dinosaurs were around in the not too distant past, not 65 million years ago. The, the earth isn't even that old. Well, in the past decade or so, a powerful evidence has come to light verifying this prediction. And in fact, Scientists have been cracking open dinosaur fossils that are supposed to be 65 to 250 million years old and discovering soft tissue in these fossils. Collagen, blood vessels with red blood cells still intact, soft, stretchy, flexible tissue that when they stretch it and let it go, it pops back to its original form. And it's been found in T-Rex, Hadrosaurs, Mosasaurs, Setacus, uh, Cetacosaurus fossils, which should have been long ago decayed if evolution is true. And, and the story on this is, is fascinating. It was, it was a secular scientist that, year, it's been, I don't know, 15 years ago maybe now, that she first published her research on the T-Rex soft tissue that she found. And of course, the, the evolutionary community was like, no way, Jose. And they went after her. No way, you've got some contamination going on here or something. There cannot be soft tissue and a 65 million year old fossil. No way. Uh, because that would disprove evolution. And so she's like, okay, fair enough. And so she goes back and is even more meticulous and careful and finds it again. So everybody else is like, wait a minute. Is it in my fossil? As everybody starts breaking open their fossils and they're all finding it. So now, okay, does this make them realize, oh, these aren't really that old? No. What they're trying to do is figure out how do you preserve these things for millions of years? That's what they're doing now. They're trying to come up with an explanation because they have to be that old if evolution is true. 
Whereas creation is predicted, no, these guys didn't live that long ago. And so we would expect there to be soft tissue if you can find at least enough sterilized type of fossils where, where they still have remnants of the, of the tissue left. And sure enough, we're finding it more and more and more. My list of these is continuing to expand. And finding it not even just in the dinosaurs, but stuff that goes even further back in supposed evolutionary history. So collagen and, and hemoglobin could theoretically last undecayed for thousands of years if kept in cool, dry, sterile, pristine environments. And yet that's not where we're finding these dinosaur fossils. That's not what we're finding these. But you wouldn't expect millions of years even then. And so based on this find, it should come as no surprise that C-14 is being discovered in dinosaur fossils. C-14, okay? Now that's significant because if you find carbon-14 in a fossil, it means it cannot be even 50,000 years old. Because what happens with carbon-14 dating is whenever something dies, it has a certain amount of C-14 in it, and its half-life is 5,730 years, which means after 5,730 years... Half of the C14 turns into nitrogen 14 in that specimen. After another 5,730 years, half of what's left turns into nitrogen 14. And then another 5,730 years, it's now one eighth of that. And it keeps getting smaller like that. We don't have the technology to detect carbon 14 after 50,000 years. And that's using, that's assuming constant nuclear decay, which we do not accept. But even using their own method, with their own assumption, if you find carbon-14 in there, it can't be even 50,000 years old because we don't have the technology to detect of carbon-14 in something that old. And yet we're finding carbon-14 in stuff that is supposed to be billions of years old in some cases. What does that tell you? Now what they have to say is, ah, oh, must be contamination. And they just throw out these examples. Okay, but well, wait a minute, we're finding it all over the place, over and over again, and it doesn't matter how careful they themselves are, not creationists, how, how careful they are to make sure there's been no contamination. So this recent discovery verifies predictions made by biblical creation. Basically, it highlights there's major problems in all the radiometric dating methods that they're using. There's major flaws that come down to their underlying assumptions. Number 13, if the earth is relatively young, then we would say that the geologic processes that are said to take eons of years, we would expect, no, we're going to find evidence like petrification, that that can actually happen very quickly under catastrophic conditions. Well, sure enough, once again, we've been able to find that scientifically. More and more scientific evidence is showing that is true. For example, in uh, 2004, five Japanese scientists published their research on rapid petrification in a sedimentary geology, a journal sedimentary geology, and they were studying mineral-rich acidic water from the explosion crater of the Tatayama volcano in central Japan. And water runs over the edge of this volcano, and it's a pretty waterfall, and some wood had fallen in the path of this mineral-rich water, and they realized, wait a minute, this wood is already petrified, and it happened within 36 years. And so they decided to conduct some more intentional experiments, and they found that silica petrification could occur in only seven years. And also in 2004, a paper was published on the rapid silicification of plants at Yellowstone, and they found within 11 months, plants were already found to have had enough silicification that plant tissues have been stabilized against collapse, and the plant structure was replicated. So this is thought that to turn something that, it, that was once alive into stone is thought to take a long, long time. And yet what we're finding is, no, what you need is catastrophic conditions, then this can happen quickly. So if you don't have the flood in your model, you're going to have totally wrong conclusions. That's the bottom line. Coal, oil, and diamonds have been argued to take millions of years to form. But again, scientists know, wait a minute, okay, well, they don't necessarily take a long time to form. Even in the lab, we can form coal, in a matter of days, hours, even minutes, with heat being the primary requirement, which of course is a big factor in the flood. Uh, volcanic clay accelerates the process, and if you have moderate pressure, all of this would be typical in the flood. Uh, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens verified the fact that catastrophic activity can create the environment to make rapid coal production. And the modern flood model would have likely brought about the 
perfect circumstances for all of these things to occur. Now with oil as well, scientists have discovered it doesn't necessarily take millions of years to form. We can form it rapidly in labs, but also we see it in nature. Uh, the Guayamas Basin, which is a trench off the Gulf of California, has a 1,500 foot thick layer of material that was deposited by billions of tiny organisms and as hot geothermal waters move through this ooze, it is converting it quickly to oil and natural gas. Okay, diamonds are thought to be millions of years old, but scientists regularly discover C14 in them. And remember, C14 should be totally undetectable if, if it's even 50,000 years old, and yet they're saying these are hundreds, if not billions of years old. So apparently diamonds aren't as old as scientists have thought. So something has happened within the last few th uh, thousand years that sped up, for example, decay rates over a period of time, aging uh, things rapidly in some cases, not, not allowing enough time to allow for the complete de uh, decay of the C14 within. So diamonds are thousands, not millions of years old. Number 14, again, if the earth is relatively young, we would predict evidence that, under, that would be uncovered indicating that the layers of the geologic column can be deposited rapidly, and that the sediment can be deposited and even then lithify rapidly. And one such example comes from what we call polystrate fossils. These are fossils that are where a single fossil, a single uh, bone or tree, cuts across multiple strata. Uh, like, for example, this tree or this tree. Now, if all of those individual sediment layers take millions of years for the material to deposit, and then between the layers, there's time too, where there wasn't deposition, there was just erosion, and then you've got to have the next layer, and the one below it has to start lithifying. This is a long process. So in the meantime, you've got a tree sticking up out of, that, out of the ground, and it's somehow not dying and decaying over millions of years. Okay, that's miraculous. I can get behind that. That's, of course, not what they're arguing. The bottom line is this sediment can't be uh, deposited over millions of years. This highlights that all of, these lay, all of this material was laid down rapidly in a single event, and it was carrying that log along with it. It's like a massive mudslide of some sort. And so we find these polystrate fossils and, of course, trees, but you also find calamites, which are a very fragile pre-flood um, a plant. Catfish have been found as polystrate fossils. This is a, f a famous one. An 80 foot long baleen whale has been discovered as a polystrate fossil. Now only one example of a polystrate fossil shows that these sediment uh, layers had to have been deposited rapidly and then lithified. Number 15, secular geologists argue that uniformitarianism is true, although there is some movement away, away from that, but evolutionary dating techniques are based on the assumption of uniformitarianism. And those techniques are the primary evidence that is used to try to say the Earth is billions of years old. And I've got an entire seminar just dealing with the age of the Earth too. But according to uniformitarianism, processes going on today have always been going on in essentially the same way. And so if a stream is, is cutting through a canyon and slowly removing its sediment, it's assumed that it's always done that in the same slow way it does today. But if the creation model is true, we would predict canyons can and do form rapidly whenever you have catastrophic conditions. And evidence substantiates our prediction once again. For example, March 19, 1982, there was a small eruption at the summit of Mount St. Helens, and it caused a massive mud flow. Within one day, a 20-mile-long, 140-foot-deep canyon was carved. Okay, this totally nullifies uniformitarianism. If uniformitarianism is true, and you're sitting here looking at this little stream that today is going through, you'd say, well, it's always been doing that. The stream is moving through here, and it's gradually eroding away that material, and so it would have taken hundreds or thousands of years for that stream to do that. Well, we know that's not what happened. There was one catastrophic event that did it in one day. <laughs> this has been called the Little Grand Canyon. It appears to be a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. Imagine what would happen if you have a global catastrophe that lasted a year. The Lake Missoula flood I mentioned was a well-documented flood from the Ice Age where water breached an ice dam and 500 cubic miles of water, 10 times the combined flow of all the rivers in the world were released in two days. It destroyed 16,000 square miles of terrain, cut hundreds of feet through solid rock, creating canyons. 
uh, carving 50 cubic miles of earth. Number 16, if the earth is relatively young, but evolutionary dating methods say that it's old, we predict that there's going to be evidence that indicates there's some things wrong with the evolutionary dating methods. They must have some flawed assumptions, and that evidence is becoming more and more readily available. So evolutionary dating methods are built upon at least three fundamental assumptions that have major problems, and each of these can be shown to be unreasonable. And there's a, there's a good book called The Young Earth by John Morris and Frank Sherwin that, that that goes into these much more in depth. I don't have time to dig into this right now. I'll deal with this in the evolution seminar. But just very briefly, for the sake of time, let's look just at one uh, of these, one of these assumptions, and, and think about some recent news that highlights that this first assumption is wrong. So the assumption is that the nuclear decay rates of the elements have been constant throughout history. In other words, if you see a piece of uranium, let's say you've got a solid piece of uranium, it decays into lead in a certain amount of time. It's got a half-life. I forget what it is. So it takes that amount of time for the uranium to turn into lead. So if you get a piece of rock and it has half uranium, half lead, then you know it's gone through one half-life. And so they know, oh, well, that's how old it is. That's the, it's half-life, whatever it is, it must be that old. But they're assuming that the uranium decayed into lead at a constant rate. Now, was there ever a time in history where that could have been sped up for some reason? Okay, now they have argued, no, I mean, we've tested this under so many different conditions, we've never been able to, to, uh, to speed it up. Well, in 2009, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, this is CERN, this is where the Large Hadron Collider is that discovered the, the God particle, you all remember that, the Higgs boson particle. They announced research that indicates that the nuclear decay rates are not constant in certain conditions. In fact, they found that the decay rate of thorium-228, if you're in water, it increased by a factor of 10,000 if you have ultrasonic cavitation while you're in water. Basically, in the flood, then you can speed this up by a factor of 10,000. Which means it's going to make the rock look a lot older than it is. That's what it practically means. 2010, a research team at Purdue released uh, some of their research that showed that radioactive decay rates on Earth seem to be affected by what's going on in the sun. Like the things going on in the sun are causing weird things to happen in our radioactive decay over here. Now, I would expect that kind of thing to happen. The sun is a pretty significant factor in everything that happens in our solar system. So who's to say that that doesn't play a role in even what's going on in the flood? I've got some theory about that. But notice, without this fundamental assumption of constant nuclear decay then the radiometric dating techniques can't be used to get the age of anything that's very old with any certainty. And therefore, the primary evidence of an old Earth dissolves. It's based on this stuff. Again, the creation model predicted, no, nah, these decay rates are not constant. And we've actually gone out and showed that to be the case with our own research. Number 17, if the Bible indicates the Earth is relatively young, the creation model would predict that evidence of that claim would surface. Now, it's true that God made the universe, though, with an immediate appearance of age. So some things are going to look old, you know, so you've got to be careful about what you select. But there's some things that still show this can't be as old as they're saying it is. And I'll just give a couple examples. I've got an article on this on our website. I think it's called 21 Reasons to Believe the Earth is Young. And I've got a book on this subject coming out, hopefully, the next uh, couple years. But moon recession. Okay, so the moon is receding away from the earth at a rate of about four centimeters per year at present. Now, it's not a linear recession. So when it was closer to the Earth, the recession was faster, and then as it gets farther away, it slows down. Okay, So based on the equation that describes the recession rate, scientists can calculate where the moon would have been compared to the Earth at different times in history. So we know, for example, that 6,000 years ago, the moon would have been 800 feet closer to the Earth than it is today. That's not a big problem for us. But if the moon is as old as they say it is based on their model, evolutionists claim the moon is four and a half billion years old. One and a half billion years ago, the moon would have been touching the earth. It'd be physically impossible for it to be older than that based on uniformitarianism. So they would have to try to explain this by saying, well, you know, the recession rate must have been different in the past. Okay, but you've now given up on uniformitarianism. 
which is what all the dating methods are based on. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Give up on unitarianism uh, because we don't believe in it. But I'm using their own assumption, and I'm showing you're wrong. Uniformitarianism cannot explain this. The moon can't be as old as you're saying it is based on your own model. It can't be. So the moon can't be that old. A six to 8,000-year-old moon is not a problem. Population statistics. Evolutionists believe humans have been on the earth for some two to three million years. Using statistical equations, we can get an estimate of how many people should be on the earth if that were true. So given conservative estimates accounting for disease, war, famine, and so forth, and if we just assume humans have been on the earth for one million rather than two to three million years, there should be 10 to the 2,000th power people on the earth today. Can you fathom that number? Probably not. <laughs> this is, well, let me help you. Okay, if you, if the, if the known universe is 28 billion light years in diameter, it's actually, they're saying I think it's even bigger now. Um, let's just stick with 28 billion light years for the sake of argument. All right. If you took miniature humans, three feet tall with narrow shoulders, and squeezed them into the universe like sardines, you could only squeeze 10 to the 82nd power people into the whole universe. So that leaves a few more. In fact, enough people to fill up 10 to the 1,918 other universes. You see a problem here? Okay. And this is just humans being around for 1 million years, not 2 to 3 million years. Okay, so if they argue, well, there just couldn't be that many people. There would be a lack of resources. And so all those extra people are just going to die off somewhere around 50 billion, if that's what the Earth's capacity is. Okay, well, we can carry that. What are the predictions you'd make for that? There should be evidence that that capacity has been reached multiple times over that amount of time, and there should be billions upon billions of hominid fossils that prove that. But even according to their own words, they have about enough hominid fossils to fill up one coffin. Based on their own words. That's what they got to work with. It's not reasonable. Now... We take the same calculations and, and use the creation model predictions. We would say about 4,350 4, years ago, six people, not including Noah and his wife, began to repopulate the earth. If that's true, there should be about 6.7 to 8.1 billion people on the planet today. Sound about reasonable to you? Another example, scientists have been measuring the Earth's magnetic field with precision since 1835, and they've determined that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying and that it has a half-life of about 1,100 years. So again, if we use their own assumption of uniformitarianism and we calculate back in time and double the Earth's magnetic field intensity every 1,100 years, you get to a point 30,000 years ago when the, when the Earth's field would have been so strong that it would have been comparable to that of a neutron star. It would have created immense heat that would have been catastrophic to the Earth, and the Earth's internal structure probably couldn't have even sustained the heat. It'd be impossible for life to exist 30,000 years ago. And yet evolutionists say life has been around not, not 30,000 years, but 3.8 billion years. Okay, so now if the Earth, again, is as young as we would say, this isn't a problem. It's not a problem to dodge here. So there's a bunch of these kind of scientific techniques available that show uniformitarianism is a terrible assumption. You've got to throw all that out, which means all of their dating methods are false. They're all based on this idea. The, the idea that whatever's going on today has always gone on in the past. There never was a global flood. They assume that. There never was a creation. Okay, now if you just eliminate that assumption and acknowledge the possibility of it, it changes everything. Your whole interpretation of everything around us changes. And that's what you have to do because uniformitarianism is terrible once you look at the actual evidence. Number 18, evolution predicts life has evolved into more complex forms. We're becoming more intelligent. That's increased over time. Starting with that single-celled organism and then ending with the state of consciousness that the hairy ape human or the hairless ape human enjoys now. So ancient man, though, is depicted as this dumb caveman uh, grunting and beating things with clubs, which actually actually kind of describes a lot of us today, really. But, but incapable of intelligent thought, right? 
and only developing more sophisticated technology as the brain evolves enough to allow him to do that. The Croatia model, though, if you think about it, we would predict the opposite. God made man fully formed and perfect. His brain and his genes were in pristine condition without any genetic defect and mutation. And he was living a long time. His ability to think and reason would have exceeded our own. Man before the flood could have been capable of amazing things because they're living 900 years. Imagine taking whatever craft you've worked on for 30 years and multiply that by, oh, I don't know, 30 30 lifetimes, okay? Imagine what you'd be capable of doing. Okay, that's what we're talking about in the pre-flood world. These aren't a bunch of dumb cavemen. It's the wrong way to view them. The Bible verifies humans are already intelligent. They're building cities, and by the time of Adam's grandson, uh, they're already using tents and having livestock and play, designing and playing musical instruments and even working with bronze and iron, which, by the way, has implications about some of the things that could have been used on the ark. They could have had actual metal bolts and so and so forth. So practices that are thought to have taken hundreds of thousands of years to develop, they would have already been capable of doing. So this is more the, the what you'd predict from an evolutionary model. You got this this constant improvement in our intellect or as we evolve. The creation model would predict that advancement doesn't as much have to do with intellect or intelligence. Entropy is going to play a big role. And as the human genome degenerates, our bodies and brains aren't as capable of doing what they would have been capable of 6,000 years ago. So we predict a gradual decline in a lot of ways. But number two, we predict that human advancement has, has also, in a major way, a lot to do with the state of a society, the decisions that its leaders are making whether the society is creating an atmosphere that encourages learning and research and exploration and how free a society is to exercise its God-given talents. And of course, whether or not that society is behaving in a way where God will providentially bless it. They're of course not going to consider that, but that's a big factor we would have to consider. So advancement would be up and down at different levels throughout history. And when a society collapses, you'd expect much of that advancement to come to a halt, many times disappear, be buried. And in fact, the Bible alludes to this kind of thing. You know, we have today third world countries living up here, and archaeologists go and dig down, and they find advanced civilizations that are doing amazing things that we don't even understand how they're doing what they're doing. And on top of them, the same civilization. The previous one collapsed, disappeared. They didn't even know it existed. And now on top of that is this third world country that's living on it. What does that tell you? We, we've, humans have been super intelligent in the past, and the reason collapse happens is for other reasons that the Bible talks about. God obliterates nations if they don't behave. That's what happens. Uh, you got to do a study of the Bible on that. So the more archaeologists dig around, the more amazing things are discovered that prove that the great intelligence of ancient man. They found amazing architecture and structures that many times are still a mystery as to how they were able to create these. From, from countries all over the world, uh, advanced ancient human intelligence, ancient boats able to ho hold uh, many people that use uh, high-tech engineering, precise maps and advanced astronomy, even though they didn't have the telescopes we have today, Advanced chemi chemist uh, chemistry and hydraulic engineering and weaponry. Uh, solid evidence indicates that the Noskin people of Peru, flourishing between uh, basically about 2,000 years ago, they were already able, able to perform successful skull surgery to relieve pressure on the brain from battle wounds. Uh, they were able to build a sophisticated system of aqueducts, many of which are still functioning today, uh, called puquios, even after 2,000 years. We found ancient... Towers and ziggurats and pyramids from ancient advanced civilizations all over the world. Abilities which societies had and then the technology often disappeared with the collapse of that society only be, to be discovered by archaeologists hundreds or thousands of years later. Also, the Noskin people in Peru flourishing some 2,000 years ago were able to draw these enormous precise pictures called geoglyphs uh, these were actually featured in the fourth Indiana Jones movie. And these are so enormous that we didn't even know a lot of these existed until we flew over them. Right? These are roads. 
These little lines in the background are roads. So they build these huge structures. They're not even sure why. And there's lots of theories as to why they did this. In the 1930s, archaeologists discovered ancient batteries, proving that people in Baghdad knew how to make batteries in 250 B.C. 2006, the New York Times ran a piece announcing the discovery of ancient Peruvian canals used for irrigation farming, thought to be four to 5,000 years old. We're talking going all the way back to the time of Abraham. And Craig Morris of the American Museum of Natural History said their use of slope and management of water flow shows again that ancient people were a lot smarter and more observant than we often give them credit for. Well, who? Who doesn't give them that credit? Well, the evolutionary community. Because in their mind, people back then are kind of, you know, dopey and cavemen-like. They're not capable of anything real sophisticated. So again, the creation model would predict humans have always been intelligent, even in ancient times. Now, the confusing thing is that it's true that a lot of our advanced technology today, we have a lot of advanced technology, but that doesn't mean that humans have actually gotten more intelligent, does it? Because if you think about each of these specific technological things that we have and where they came from, the primary uh, most important discoveries that sparked like some kind of explosion in some technological area. Okay, so think about the discovery of how to harness electricity, telephones, the internal combustion engine, and uh, airplanes, and, and uh, uh, microprocessors, these kind of things. A lot of times they can be traced back to individuals who either accidentally stumbled across something or design something after many, many, many trial and errors where they finally ultimately discovered something important. It wasn't about humans particularly being more evolved. Now, after we discover something important, humans are really good at building on that discovery and quickly inventing things. And so you'll see these explosions of technology and history that all go back to some key innovation or key discovery that was a lot of times just an accident that, that they found it. Well, now we have more people on the planet. We, have, we, we can communicate with each other much more easily, and that allows progress to happen really fast. But the primary discoveries that allow that, that spark these things, are oftentimes lucky breaks. Really what we would say is providential blessings. It's God allowing a providential blessing. Like, hey, you didn't know about this, but let me give you this because I'm going to bless you all for some way, for some reason. And we have had a lot of that in this country. A lot of the technological boom in the world that the world enjoys came back to individuals, a lot of times who were creationists, by the way, that caused a major blessing in our country and to the whole world. So who knows? What was the pre-flood world like? You know, what could they have been capable of? What if they had discovered electricity? Who knows what they could have been able to do that we don't know about? Because that whole, they're gone. It's wiped out. Number 19, since the Bible mentions giant humans, we'd predict there would be evidence that supports the idea that humans could get pretty large. So are giants a mythical idea like some people have all oh, the Bible teaches myth, like Jack and the Beanstalk or something? Well, apparently giants aren't mythological according to evolutionists. The popular science podcast uh, out of, put out of Cambridge conducted an interview with Lee Berger in 2007. Lee Berger is the paleoanthropologist, University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. This is the guy that's been in the news a lot over the last decade because he's found the big finds, like Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi that are in a lot of the science magazines. So this group had an opportunity to go down and visit his fossil collection at the university where he's a professor, and they discussed the fossils in his museum. And in the article following the interview, Chris Smith, the editor, he said, one of the most interesting things that the fossil record reveals is that we went through a period of extreme giantism. These were people routinely over seven feet tall. They were huge, he says. And um, Berger says, well, you probably heard the myth that ancient humans were tiny, and some of them were tiny. But as we moved through the period of 0.5 million to 300,000 years ago in Africa, now that translates to post-flood pre-Abraham. They go through a period of giantism. And he then proceeds to show the group uh, an example of one of the giant femurs from a species dubbed Homo heidelbergensis by paleoanthropologists. Berger says, they're huge. That's so big we can't even calculate how big this human was. 
you need an NBA basketball player to get someone of the height someone like this would have been, something like over seven feet tall. So these are enormous. They don't even know for sure how large they would have to be. He just surmises over seven feet tall. There's a lot of them. And so Smith responds to Berger and says, could this just be some weird abnormality, some weird exception found, uh, somebody that has some kind of weird gene going on? Well, Berger says, no, because we found a lot of them. Everywhere we find them, we find them enormous. These are what we call archaic Homo sapiens. Some people refer to them as Homo heidelbergensis. These individuals are extraordinary. They are giants, all right? So notice, uh, first of all, that he acknowledges that they're humans. They're Homo sapiens. But they're ancient and they're big. Okay, they're giant. And it's not just some weird abnormality. There seem to be a race of these individuals. And if Homo heidelbergensis isn't big enough for you, back in 1944, uh, Rolf von Koenigswald of the Nether Netherlands Indies Geological Survey found some enormous jawbones, and Time magazine ran an article announcing the discovery. Notice the title of the article, Giants in Those Days, quoting from Genesis 6-4. Koenigswald first found a big jawbone which looked more human than Pithecanthropus's, but was so massive that he thought it could not possibly be a man's. Then he found a still larger jaw, the biggest ever discovered, which was unmistakably human. It was apparently the most primitive, truly human fossil ever discovered. Koenigswald named it Meganthropus paleojavanicus. Say that one two or three times. Now his, uh, and that wasn't the end, his crowning find dwarfed even Meganthropus. He found three astounding teeth. They were six times as big as a modern man's molars. Weidenreich is sure from the pattern of their biting surfaces that they are definitely human, all right? So it's possible, these are enormous humans, and it's possible these aren't all references like to the giants, like Goliath. Uh, some of the, uh, I would hypothesize, especially the pre-flood world, would have been conducive to a larger size human all around, not just the animals and plants, but humans too. Why not? And in, in, in a widespread way, which is what Weidenreich suggests. So maybe, maybe not. But notice again, we have scientific evidence that verifies the Bible's predictions of larger humans being possible, and it helps to substantiate the creation model. He has named this man monster Gigantanthropus. <laughs> I like that name. I think I'm going to name a child that sometime. Yeah. Weidenreich now believes that gigantism and massiveness may have been a general or at least widespread character of early mankind. And if the fossil evidence isn't enough for you, we can look around today and see examples of extremely large people, can we not? Even though we're thousands of years beyond the optimal period of human health and longevity, I, whenever I think of giants, I think of Andre the Giant, right? You all remember him, professional wrestler? He was short, seven feet, four inches, compared to the tallest man alive today, Sultan Kosin, eight feet, three inches tall, and we even know in his case that it's a result of a pituitary condition, which resulted in overproduction of growth hormone. So we even know some of the things that could happen in the body that would allow growth that big. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest man in medical history that has been reliably confirmed was Robert Bodlow, died in 1940, measuring in at one inch under nine feet. So weighed 491 pounds at one point. So the giants of the Bible are not mythical beings. They're real humans, albeit big ones. All right, number 20, if the flood happened, we predict that stories from such a cataclysmic event had to have been preserved as ancient oral traditions or in writings. I mean, surely if that happened, that would be passed down. And since the flood would have been before the time, apparently, when writing was occurring, then stories would have been initially passed down by word of mouth. And so you'd expect there to be similarities between the stories, but you'd expect them not to be exactly the same. And likely many distortions to have been made over the millennia. All you have to do is uh, play that telephone game. You know, if you ever played that where you whisper something in somebody's ear and they pass it down. And by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's totally different. You'd expect a lot of uh, change to happen. Well, sure enough, there are over 250 distinct legends throughout the world of an ancient great flood. Here's just a few. In Greece, Zeus wanted to destroy humans with a flood and start over. Deucalion and his wife are put in a large wooden chest, and a flood came and covered almost all of the mountain peaks. 
In Babylon, Utnapishtim is warned by a god to build a boat in preparation for a terrible flood. The boat he covers with pitch. He brings animals of all kinds and provisions. He sends out a dove to see if the flood had receded, then a swallow, then a raven, which didn't return. They left the boat and worshipped their gods. Uh, the Toltec Indians tell of a great flood that destroyed the first world, very specifically, 1,716 years after creation. That's very, that's very close to the Hebrew text. A few people escaped in a closed uh, chest. Now, whenever I was uh, studying at Grand Canyon, I learned about the Anasazi Indians, the ancient Indians of Arizona that have their own uh, flood legend. In China, the Nasu people, God sent a messenger to tell three sons of a coming flood, dumb listen, ironically, and built a wooden boat. And then a huge flood came and covered the whole earth, and Dumb was saved and had three sons that repopulated the earth. There's amazing similarities. They don't match the Bible perfectly, but if they did, you would think there's probably some kind of collusion that happened at some point in history. In the books, The Discovery of Genesis and Genesis and the Mystery Confucius Couldn't Solve, Nelson even argues that the origin of the modern Chinese word for boat is comprised of the ancient forms of the words for vessel, eight, and mouth, or people. So a vessel for eight people. And Nelson uh, makes a case for several other Chinese words being traced back to the flood and even the Tower of Babel and creation, and also argues from historical evidence that the Chinese were originally monotheistic. So everybody would have been initially monotheistic, starting with Babel, right? Eventually uh, polytheism and so forth would have come about later. So again, over 250 legends of a major flood and the resemblances to Scripture in many cases is very notable, uh, just as we'd expect to be the case if the flood actually happened. All right, in light of the catastrophic nature of the flood as well as the drastic change in lifespans after the flood, we would predict that during and after the flood for a period of time, there'd probably be evidence of irregular rates for processes that today are constant and slow, like nuclear decay rates being accelerated, tectonic plate movement, erosion of canyons, tree ring growth, ice layer formation. And, uh, and we'll discuss some of that, uh, I think, tomorrow morning. So let's move to number 22. Evidence that catastrophism, so rapid burial from catastrophes rather than uniformitarianism, would explain much of the geologic column. We would expect that to be uncovered and if this is, this is, of course, very widespread. Uh, we've seen examples of polystrate fossils. Uh, we've seen uh, evidence of worldwide rock layers that aren't just localized, but they go across the whole uh, earth. And then you've got dinosaur graveyards that are found all over uh, the planet where you've got, okay, this isn't, you know, just a bunch of uh, sh uh, seashells in one place or even just a, a bunch of little critters that get kind of caught and buried. We're talking about places where you have hundreds to thousands of dinosaurs that are huge. Like, for example, my work in Wyoming, um, the, this place where we were doing dinosaur excavation out there, uh, Art Chadwick thinks from what we found already, there are at least 5,000 dinosaurs buried in this one ranch that were obliterated by some kind of huge catastrophic event involving a lot of water tore them to bits and pieces and carried them a long enough distance to organize their, their bones by weight, by gravity, okay, which just means they had to travel a big distance. And, and we're talking a major catastrophe. And again, these aren't, these aren't little, you know, tiny dinosaurs, okay? We've got Nanotyrannus out there and Triceratops and uh, Pachycephalosaurus and the Edmontosaurus, big guys, and yet you've got 5,000 of them that are killed by some. What can do that? What can kill 5,000 dinosaurs and do that to them? What kind of power would be required? And so we find dinosaur fossil graveyards all over. These are just the ones there that we're working in in Wyoming. <clears throat> Many fossils show evidence of rapid burial, catastrophic conditions, as would be predicted if the flood happened. Notice this fish is in the middle of his dinner. When he gets hit, how about this one? Can you tell what's going on here? This is an ichthyosaur. Basically looks, it's kind of an ancient version of a dolphin in appearance, but he's, she's giving birth. Giving birth whenever she gets buried. Dinosaurs, you, rarely do you find dinosaur fossils 
fully articulated, right, with all of their bones there where you can see what they looked like in life. Instead, you find bits and pieces, a few of their bones. But if you can find them articulated like these, then they will very usually be in this kind of posture that they call a death pose. It's the epistatonic death posture and is understood to be due to death by water. Their heads are thrown back. Their tails are curved forward. A lot of times their mouth is open like they're gasping uh, for air. And, uh, and this is understood, again, to be due to death by water. Catastrophic water-involving situation. Numbers 23 through 26 concern the fossil record. We would predict the fossil record will reveal fully functional distinct creatures whenever they first appear in the fossil record. We would expect the fossil record might reflect the progression of the flood, at least in the flood layers that there would be fossil anomalies to evolutionary thinking that won't fit the evolutionary timeline, and that fossil graveyards would be found uh, in, the, in the fossil record. So, you know, that first prediction there, fully functional distinct creatures when they first appear, I already talked about the, uh, the Cambrian explosion. This is a major problem for the evolutionary mindset. I mean, they, the fossil record explodes onto the scene. They're already told you they're already complex. Uh, but more than that... Um, if evolution is true, I don't get too much, I can do a whole session just on this, but if evolution is true, you should have the original creature shows up and then it diversifies. And over time, it becomes very different from its original form. So diversity should precede disparity is what that means in paleontology. The disparity is the big differences in body types that should come about later. The fossil record starting in the Cambrian shows disparity, then diversity, which is exactly what we would predict. It fits the orchard model. You've got distinct creatures, totally different body types. Almost all of the body types, over half of them, I think, show up immediately in the Cambrian. They're already totally distinctly different body types, and then they start diversifying right after that. It's exactly what we predict. It's a major problem. For the evolutionary model, it falsifies evolution. Notice what Richard Dawkins said about this. The Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups, and we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Why would it delight us? Well, because that's what we'd predict. So the fossil record proves what we would say. Oh, oh but, but creationists can't make any predictions? No. Number 24 and 25, evolutionary theory predict that fossils in the lowest strata should be simple, closer to the single-celled organism that everything supposedly came from. Trilobites are considered an index fossil for the Cambrian strata, right, where the fossil record basically explodes onto the scene. And as you move higher in the column, the fossils should become more complex as they evolve towards humans. And uh, in the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate, Bill Nye said, hey, you never see those higher organisms, those complex creatures, mixing with the lower organisms. And if you did, you'd, cho you'd change the world because you'd disprove evolution. Now, the amazing thing is the index fossil of the Cambrian, the trilobite, is very complex the more we've studied this. It's considered like one of the first creatures to show up, so it should be extremely simple. But the eye of the trilobite is equipped with aplanatic lenses, dual lenses, as opposed to even the human eye, which has a single refractive lens. So scientists acknowledge the design of the trilobite eye is even more complex than our own. And it shows up at the very bottom of the fossil record. This is supposed to be primitive. And this creature is allowed to see down on the ocean floor. It can see in murky water and so forth. So the trilobite is evidence against evolution. Now, even if we are acknowledged that trilobites were primitive, it's not true that you don't see what they would say is higher and lower mammal, animals mixing. There's, there's several examples of strange anomalies, artifacts that have been found that shouldn't be where they're found, and they're very controversial, sometimes even among creationists, about what they seem to be. And as one example is this famous old Meister footprint that appears to be a fossilized sandal print. Now the problem is there's a trilobite in it. 
Now, it's disputed by some. This, ah, surely this is not a sandal print, but it, it's the kind of thing we would expect if the creation model is true or the human-like uh, footprints found in coal veins that are supposed to have been laid down 248 million years before humans are around or the human pickaxe found in Cretaceous sediment supposed to be at least 65 million years old. How about the fossil of a mammal with a dinosaur in its stomach? <clears throat> Has a Cetacosaurus fossil in its stomach. Mammals like that aren't supposed to be around with the dinosaurs. They don't show up till later. Or living fossils like the coelacanth, creatures that you find in the fossil record supposedly millions of years ago, and then they disappear. Okay, you don't find them in the rock layers above, so they assume they went extinct. And then you got this fisherman, and he's like, oh, wait a minute. Modern fisherman finds this guy that compared to the fossil record, and they're like, that's a coelacanth. Not only did it not go extinct, it didn't evolve. It stayed the same over millions of years. So there's a lot of implications to that. I mean, just because you don't have fossils in a certain layer, that doesn't mean the creature's not actually alive somewhere, just because the fossil's not there. And it also means that evolution doesn't happen. <laughs> you just get you can get diversifying, you get some variety of a kind of a creature, but you don't see it changing. Now, the evolutionary model struggles with these kind of things, but they're, they're predicted by the creation model. We would argue that just because something's lower, it doesn't necessarily, in, in the fossil record, it doesn't mean that it's more primitive or simple. What we would say about the fossil record is, the fossil record is not a uh, record of, of life over time. It's a record of death in the flood. So from bottom to top, what the fossil record is, is all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, Genesis 7, 11. So in the ocean, that's the first stuff that's going to get wiped out. So guess what shows up first in the fossil record? Sea floor creatures. That whole habitat gets obliterated. Then it starts moving inland. It takes out the fish. And then it gets to the coast and it starts taking out the amphibians and then the reptiles and it starts moving inland. All right, so the, the, the fossil record appears to be a reflection of the flood's progression as it wipes out habitats sequentially. <clears throat> so it's a graveyard. And, and there's some other factors that, that can play in as well, and in certain cases it's very complex. You know, but bottom line is the, the fossil record supports what the creationists would predict. Fossil graveyards, clear example of places where Large numbers of animals are caught, unable to escape some kind of cataclysmic fossil forming event. These are found all over the world. All right, number 27. We, so sedimentary rock is generally understood to be formed by bodies of water. So if the flood happened, you'd expect sedimentary rocks to be found prevalently, especially in these worldwide layers. And sure enough, that is what they are. They're the most common rocks exposed on the surface of the earth. They make up 75% of the surface rocks of the earth, even on mountains. Number 28, seismites. We predict these will be found if the flood and specifically catastrophic plate tectonics is true. It's, I alluded to this in a previous session. These are layers of sediment that are known to form during earthquakes. So layers of sediment that are where you've got sediment underwater. So picture yourself being on the beach. And, uh, and you're, you're out there where, there where the sediment is a little bit wet, right? So the, where the water kind of comes up and goes back on. A little bit wet. And let's say you start uh, jumping on the sand there and compacting it, right? Well, what happens is the water in there, you basically are causing an earthquake. And what happens is the water in there escapes as you're compressing it. And if that, sand, if that was covered up and then turned to stone with some kind of cementing agent, and then later it all eroded away where you could see that layer that had been preserved from you jumping on it. It would have these little squiggly lines, these convolutions that show the seismic activity, basically, that you're creating to uh, compress that sand, for example. Okay, so that's a seismite. So when you have earthquakes, it'll create seismite layers. And so you can even correlate when earthquakes happen in history by going down through layers and finding those seismites. And in fact, a, a creation geologist has done that, correlating biblical events with seismites. That's a fascinating study he's done out there in the Jordan area. 
So the problem is usually when you find these, they're just a few inches thick because the earthquakes aren't powerful enough to do bigger than that. And you don't have enough water drenching enough sand to be able to do that. But what we found in, in Wyoming was a little bit bigger than a few inches thick. We're finding seismite layers that are meters, you know, several meters in thickness. There is no known way to, no, no, no known earthly mechanism to create seismites that are this big. We're talking earthquakes that are just unheard of. And so whenever we're finding these out there in Wyoming, and guess what is, guess where we're at there in Wyoming? There's a massive mountain range there called the Rocky Mountains. It's forming in the flood. You think that's going to create a few earthquakes if it's forming rapidly? And what's again, why is there an enormous amount of water out there in Wyoming? Well, again, this is during the flood. These are the, the, the last layers of, that are being deposited in the flood, they're water drenched. You got massive earthquakes. It causes these huge uh, seismites to form. And interestingly, the dinosaur fossil beds I'm studying out there, where you've got, again, 5,000 dinosaurs on one ranch all obliterated, some of them are sticking out of these seismites, which tells you what's killing them. The power of what is going on as those Rocky Mountains are forming are disintegrating life that's in the area, turning them to bits and pieces just obliterating them. So you got a picture, I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, videos where you, there's like a camera looking over a plane and an earthquake happens and you can see the epicenter and then you see the land kind of make this wave. Right? That's what happens whenever you see an earthquake. Well, these kind, you got a picture, you know, here's a dinosaur. And then it gets thrown up and just smashed and obliterated. Now that's the kind of power we're talking about. And imagine the bloodbath from that happening. Now, this is, this is power that is occurring. Number 29, if the creation model is true and the incident at the Tower of Babel is true, we'd expect there to be evidence that that event happened too. From, for example, stories that have been passed down, like with the flood and the existence of dinosaurs. Recall the flood legend of the Toltec Indians, and, and after, in that legend, after the survivors leave the chest, they wandered around the earth until they found a place to build a, a zaquali, a large tower, in case another flood came. And during that time period, their languages are confused, and they spread out over the earth. Uh, the Miaotzu people of China and their flood legend had poured for 40 days, and then there were 55 days of drizzle, and this flood covered the mountain ranges. Nua and his family and animals were saved in a wide boat. And the birds were sent out, sacrifices made. The survivors made cities and spoke the same language, built a very high tower, which was wrong. God mixed their language, didn't finish the city and tower, and separated over the earth. Dan Landis documents other examples. In the Burmese legend, the people build a pagoda to try to reach the heavens. And their god came down angrily and confused their languages and caused them to spread out. In the Congo, instead of building a tower, the people balanced themselves on big poles. Uh, in the Mexican version, they build a tower out of clay. In India, it was demons, and they built an altar to the sky and are thwarted by the sky god. Uh, Africa and Greece, the Assam people, many have this ancient story about this structure being built into the sky, languages for some reason being confused so that the people get spread out. And as with the flood legends, the details don't match, but they wouldn't be expected to match because the traditions are passed down orally for centuries. And if they did match, you'd expect there could have been some kind of collusion at some point. But this common thread involving a god, a tall structure, the confusion of the languages, this is a common theme that would be predicted based on the flood model. All right, num we'll cover number 30 in our last prediction, our last prediction in our next uh, session. So the creation model can certainly make verifiable predictions, and this is just a sampling of some of those. The creation model is a scientific model. It is supported by the evidence. Evidence that the evolutionary model has problems with. All right, let's see here. So I guess Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, is just that. How about that?
All right. What time is it? 3.15. What time are we supposed to start the next one? I've forgotten already. That sounds good. Yeah, let's break 15 minutes. If you got any more questions, bring them up to me, and we'll crank it back up in 15 minutes.